Mr. Luther and uh, Mr. Sharad will delve into the intriguing topic of idea generation and idea evaluation. Their insights promise to shed light on the crucial intersection of creativity and practicality in shaping successful initiatives. Let's give a warm welcome to both of them as they take us through this enlightening journey. everyone for taking your time for this. Uh, I'll start with a very quick intro. Uh, so I'm the founder and CEO of Metbee. My name is Shorya. Uh, just to give you a little bit of insight about my own experience, um, uh, Metbee was founded back in 2019 and interestingly we were incubated here itself at Instart Foundation. Uh, we are currently a startup valued at 30 CR and uh, we started our journey from Kirodimal College, Delhi University. Um, since then we have now taught than 7,000 paying learners from across India. We've had uh, mentors from brands like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Nike, PepsiCo, World Bank, and I can kind of wrap about the brands that we have on board. And we've raised some of from some of the marquee investors in India, um, including the top management of Google, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, LPs of some of the most popular funds in here in India, uh, including Marwadi Catalyst Ventures and uh, a few more. Uh, to name. We are also incubated at IIM Bangalore apart from Insert Foundation and uh, today we'll be talking about a few things from my own experience and Rajan's experience on building a venture from 0 to say 30 CR is where we are. And uh, about my own personal experience, I have a degree in, batch, uh, in BCom Honours uh, but most of my experience kind of came through running and building this venture. Uh, I'm a two-time static speaker. I've given guest lectures at IITs, IIMs, uh, more than 100 institutions in India. And uh, yeah, let's get started. So um, I think this is a very popular quote from one of my favorite entrepreneurs. His name is Sean Parker, which is that running a startup is like eating glass. You just start to like the taste of your own blood, right? So this is the easiest way to tell you that it's not an easy journey. Only top 1% of the startups get funded out of which only the next 25% of the startups who raise the first round are able to raise the second round. Out of that, only 10% of the startups are able to raise the third round, right? So uh, it's a very, very difficult journey to get into, probably as hard, probably as hard as making it into, uh, you know, IAS or for that matter, or getting into top IITs. It's, um, it's excruciatingly difficult to kind of cover this journey and that too if you want to do it in a short period of time. So um, now one of the things that people don't talk about is why they should start, right? And I think a lot of people would talk about idea, they'll talk about impact, but considering that we are based out of India, we need to talk about more practical reasons which need to be evaluated before you decide that you want to do a venture, right? So the first and probably the most important question that you need to ask yourself uh, if you want to start a venture is, can your family sustain itself without your financial contribution? Right? So irrespective of the age, uh, irrespective of where you're coming from, in case your family is dependent upon your own income for its sustenance, then probably starting a company is not the best idea because money is made over the long term. Right? Uh, building a business is more of a capital generation activity and capital is always generated over long, long terms, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship. Right? So the first few years are usually spent in laying down the foundation and therefore it's extremely hard to expect a regular inflow of cash. Right? And hence this question needs to be answered before you decide to get started with your journey. Secondly, motive. Uh, a lot of people get started with building businesses because they feel that it's easy money. A lot of people are, have actually made easy money in the Indian ecosystem but that is probably because most of the investors, most of the VCs were unaware about how the ecosystem is supposed to be run and a lot of people wanted to come in as investors because it was that new shining thing that everyone wanted, everyone wanted to be a part of, right? But over a period of time you realize that entrepreneurship is a lot about the impact than about money. So money is usually made in the long term in case you are exceptionally good. Otherwise, all that you're going to leave behind through your venture is going to be some kind of impact. Right? So if impact is not one of the motivations, if not the only motivation, then you shouldn't probably think about building a business at the first place. Next, relative opportunity costs. So uh, also known as FOMO in the Gen Z language. So most of us are trying to 
you know do every do something that everyone is trying to do right uh, everyone wants ghar paisa ghar gaadi family and those kind of things are very very important but if you want to do what all of your peers are trying to do or people around you are trying to do irrespective of your age you would not be able to build a venture so when you would be trying to build a venture your friends would be probably uh, you know uh, be going out somewhere they might be having their own set of family commitments you might not be able to give the same kind of time to uh you know those activities and you should be okay with that entire process of accepting that hey i we, i would not be able to do that right and this is again this is not about only youngsters this is not about people who are from a specific age group right fomo changes over a period of time maybe for kids fomo is partying maybe for adults it's get togethers right it evolves over a period of time but at the end of the day that choice needs to be made and that choice is very very important uh next vision is more important than cost benefit analysis i have uh, done quite a lot of courses from uh you know iims and now i i was invited last year at iim indore to take a guest lecture uh and we talk about cost benefit analysis a lot when we are talking about businesses right there are multiple frameworks be it swot be it be it pestle we're always figuring out hey is it worth it to do something or this particular idea but when you do a cost benefit analysis of entrepreneurship it's always going to turn out to be something that's negative right so the point is it's never sensible to run a startup because the odds are always going to be against you we have seen multiple case studies of startups like snapdeal scaling from 0 to a valuation of 5 billion dollars and then going back to a 100 million dollar valuation right uh, we are currently seeing the fall of one of the largest tech techs by juice from 22 billion dollars to now 5 billion and probably can go down a lot more with how the things are looking right so the point is that there is no point in your startup journey where you like okay i've made it it doesn't happen and that is why it's very very important for you to not really do a cost benefit analysis of entrepreneurship as a function you should do a cost benefit analysis when you're trying to evaluate an idea but not of entrepreneurship as a function because the answer is always going to be no we can move on to the next slide so now uh, i think one of the biggest things that we talk about is that a st- how is a startup different from a business it's usually the innovation right uh, that a startup is an innovative idea it is not just a copy paste business model that has been replicated for thousands of years or for hundreds of years in the in the ecosystem right it is something new it could be a new way of doing things but what we don't understand is that innovation is not just doing something new innovation is not me figuring out a better way to water plants it's actually me figuring out a better way to water plants that i can sell to other people right and that is where commercialization comes into play so if i am a great inventor if i have a lot of experience in say a specific field it could be sciences it could not be it could be arts it could be a specific domain but at the end of the day if i am not able to market it to an extent where i am able to commercialize it and that model of commercialization is not scalable it cannot be a value proposition for the business and therefore it would not be considered as innovation right okay um uh, now picking a problem is very important i think this is something that uh, I, i think it's very very easy to understand that you got to pick a problem if you want to work on a startup idea now often we feel that there are not enough problems around so for that uh, i would want to conduct a very brief activity which will help you understand uh, you know how many ideas are there around you so if you look at this room right now and you forget about the constraints that are there in terms of what this room could possibly be think about the problems in this room the first problem is the click that i'm hearing through the speaker right now right another problem is that maybe the air conditioning is not uh, it's not consistent like certain areas of the room are cooler certain areas of the room are not right uh, maybe right now we don't have any kind of audio bar- barriers and therefore uh, the audio is also not equally audible across the room right maybe maybe it's not so the point is that when we are looking inside a room and when we concentrate at a specific place we are able to find that there are so many problems within this room it's definitely not comparable to a seven star hotel right so the point is that if we are looking at a room and we are able to see that there are so many problems within this room there's a world outside so the problem of not having a problem is usually because we are not able to focus on a specific segment a specific function 
a specific area or a specific domain where you would want to build or find a problem and that is the reason why usually we feel that there are not enough problems around so whenever you want to build something no matter where it is which function it is which sector it is once you start reading about it once you start observing you will find that there are quite a few problems that are present in that particular area now the question that is actually difficult to answer is which one should you spend your time and energy on right and here is a framework suggested by y combinator which is uh, one of the best incubators from the world interestingly i and rajan also graduated from y combinator startup school back when it was not open for everyone so here are the six parameters on the basis of which you can evaluate a startup problem it's a very very easy framework to understand not at all difficult now what we are going to do is we are going to pick a popular idea and we are going to see you know from the past if it actually made sense so the rule is very simple if a particular startup idea is meeting at least three out of the six parameters that are mentioned over here it is a good problem to solve okay i think all of us are aware about uh, zomato as an idea yes so zomato if we look at let's see which of these parameters does it actually correspond to was food delivery popular in 2010 2012 it was right food delivery when we used to make calls to the restaurants not through apps yeah. right because that is still food delivery the only difference is that it's not tech driven so we used to call up these restaurants we used to ask for food we used to understand if there were any discounts going on and we used to order make make our orders and we used to get all of these uh, you know delivery people and they used to have an extra charge usually about 50 100 bucks that we used to pay and that's how it worked so it was a popular problem was it growing were, were more and more people looking to get the food delivered to their places yes right the delivery fleets that were required by restaurants was going up there are multiple reports that were actually suggesting that at this point was it an urgent problem not really more of a luxury right so not everyone would want food to be delivered at all times it's not a do or die kind of a feature right was it an expensive problem food delivery yes yes for the restaurants it was very expensive even for people if you know restaurants used to at the end of the day charge that cost from the people from the customers right and therefore over a period of time we did not realize it but we were paying huge premiums to restaurants for getting this food delivered to our places right and therefore it is an expensive problem to solve next is it mandatory of course not it's not like the government doesn't ask you to deliver you know get food delivered to your place so it's not really a mandatory problem is it frequent do you get food delivered at least once at least more than once a month yes so every weekend we used to call up our favorite restaurants and get food delivered and therefore it is a frequent problem to solve for so how many parameters was zomato trying to solve for 1 2 3 4 4 4 more than 3 now you can decide to pick up any problem that you want or any startup that today is a unicorn or for that matter is successful to a certain degree and you would realize that it's at least three or more of such parameters that they were actually trying to solve for right let's move on to the next slide so i have a question yes of course of course yeah yeah i just want to understand how popularity is a problem so popularity is a parameter okay it's not a problem something is already popular let's say that uh, i'm just talking from uh, a current perspective point of view for example i want to get into the food industry but i know that it's already popular why would i want to get my hand on to some segment which is already popular as well? precisely so what you will notice is that popularity so if you talk about a new idea which is popular you will realize that it's not likely to meet the other parameters now it would not be urgent now it would not be frequent or expensive so it has to be popular along with e, the other so popularity is one of the six parameters so you need to match any three so for example covid masks was a very popular problem to solve right everyone needed a covid mask at the end of the day but now we are not seeing a million multi million dollar startups solving for it why because probably pop popularity is the only trait that it has it is not a frequent thing anymore 
you none of you are wearing masks so that's gone it's not expensive at all it's not mandatory also anymore so you when you actually cross check you'll realize that only popularity is there nothing else is there and that is where the three threshold number really plays a huge role so now the now one of the things that we need to understand is that startup idea is always a hypothesis it's always a statement with multiple variables right if x number of people need y and are willing to pay z amount then my startup would be a success right now when you say that if x amount of people are able to are actually are actually looking for y that is also dependent upon their existing set of problems which is another variable so a startup idea is nothing but an equation with a lot of solved and unsolved variables some of them are solved because we get the data from newspapers from uh, the problems that we are facing ourselves but a lot of them are usually unsolved for which is something that you need to actually understand and try and solve it for yourself as an entrepreneur so how does this equation look like i think this is not very difficult to understand so how do we calculate the value of the potential opportunity let's try and break this down according to this equation given by mckenzie it's equal to number of target customers into frequency that the solution is used into willingness to pay for the current solution divided by level of satisfaction with current available alternatives now just to clarify this equation is not an equation where you can input numbers or metrics for all of these factors it is an indicative equation right and therefore all the components are more likely to be subjective and objective now someone who is not doing the right research will probably end up getting the wrong result of this equation which is why there is no sure shot way to know if a startup idea is going to be a success or not make sense so we were talking about zomato what is the number of target customers for zomato it's huge number it's a big number very big number why because more and more people are looking to get food delivered even people who have middle incomes who on their weekends they are willing to spend 2 to 200 to 300 bucks to feed their families something that's slightly more fancier than what's cooked at home right so it's a huge number middle class plus all the classes of population of middle class that's a very big number in india frequency that the solution is used most of the people in india at least order food three times a month if not more <coughs> right next willingness to pay for current current solution most of the people know that the delivery cost of getting this food delivered is at least going to be 50 bucks if not more and a lot of restaurants were previously charging more than that so to people it makes a lot of sense now interestingly earlier zomato used to give this to people for free free delivery like they did not charge anything now for a lot of us or for a lot of people who are looking at it from pure business perspective you would realize that that is that doesn't make sense right they are raising a lot of funds and they're burning it because there is a cost of managing all of these logistics yet zomato is not charging anything for those logistics from the customers why do you think they were doing it marketing growing their customer base all of those reasons correct so basically to induce a behavior right and now they have reached the stage where all the restaurants and in fact also the people are dependent upon zomato or swiggy for that matter to order food now it's a part of their behavior and therefore there's a very strong reliance on it so even if zomato tomorrow says i'm going to charge 150 bucks what will you do will pay because you can't find another alternative to save those 50 bucks and over a period of time they will do this this is exactly what jio did right so when we look at startups we feel like yaar kya kar rahe hai itna paisa uthaya hua hai and they're burning crores of rupees a month but while of course not true for all startups but quite a few of them are doing it for a very specific reason which doesn't make sense in the short term which doesn't make sense in the balance sheet or in the pnl statement but makes a lot of sense when you look at their numbers in the long run 
right? Now, uh, interestingly, this is something that you might not be aware of, but why do you think most of the early stage startups fail? It's not because of lack of money. It's not because the idea is bad. It is not because the problem statement isn't there or the market size is too small. The biggest reason why startups fail is because they are unable to get their team right. In fact, that's the case for more than 60% of failures in early stage startups. Right? Picking out the wrong co-founder. Picking out the wrong co-team members. Right? Not having healthy team dynamics. And there are multiple reasons around this. So, again, I'll try to break it down into a few factors that I personally feel are very, very important. First suggestion, don't always reach out to the person who is closest and most familiar to you when you are looking to build a business. Because that is very intuitive, right? Okay, I'm going to reach out to my best friend, my best buddy, my colleague. They might understand me, my husband, my wife. These are the people who we can trust blindly. Because we know that they know us. But it's not always a great idea. Why? Because in most of the cases, these two people or these three, four, five people haven't worked together in a professional capacity. And people are very different when you're working with them professionally and when you're dealing with them on a personal level. Right? Uh, they have different ways to react to problems. They have different ways of finding solutions. They have different styles of working which may or may not match with yours. Right? So when you're looking to build a team, first look at do you believe in that other person? Now that is the reason why it's very important for you to find people who you can trust but have a certain level of professional maturity and professional alignment with you as well. Right? So if you, are, if you think that your partner or your best friend or your sister or your brother or maybe even your parents have the maturity to build with you right and they would be able to keep the professional and the professional life separate then prob they are probably great people to build with there are multiple examples of husband wife startups which are now at unicorn level there are multiple startups which have now at 100 million plus valuations multiple brothers who have built successful businesses together but like i mentioned it may or may not align with you so try to look at your overall professional circles and pick the best person who has both the traits Next, they need to believe in your hypothesis. So we discussed the hypothesis in the previous slide, right? We talked about that equation. Are you both or are all of you aligned with that equation that yes, we feel that if all of these three, three things happen, this business idea will be a success. If the answer to that question is a no, then it may not be the best idea to work with that particular person. Right? So now you might say, Shaurya, but we might have differences over how we want to build this. Are those differences not acceptable? Those differences are and can be accepted if you are able to eventually reach a common ground. Right? Which will exactly show if you have the uh, professional alignment to work together or not. So at the end of the day, you need to be able to always reach a common ground for at least most of your decisions. And most importantly, the hypothesis. Make sense? Moving on, flexibility. So shit goes down in startups, right? This is like a factual statement now. Things are not going to work out. A uh, lot of things are going to go bad. Customers are going to hate you. Your investors might dislike you. Some of your family members might disown you. That will happen, right? Why are you doing it at this age? Why are you doing it at this time? Don't you have these XYZ responsibilities to take care of? XYZ. <laughs> I think it has happened to a lot of people. <laughs> very common. So uh, at this point, it's very important for you to see if your co-founder and you are both flexible to deal with it and to deal with everything that goes bad in your startup. Right? Often what happens is that we have our backup plans. We can have a backup job, a backup degree, or backup professional qualification, which will ensure that we can get back into the workforce whenever we want. <coughs> right? So if at the very first instance of things going wrong, your co-founder rushes to that job, 
then they are probably not the right people to build with right um, next persistence very very important you will have to persist with the idea for a period of time now nobody can define what this period of time should be it could be six months for some of you it could be one year for some of you it could be more i have seen people struggle for five seven years on a venture and still fail i have seen people struggle for the same amount of time and being successful eventually to build a unicorn startup i'm talking about is my trip so um, interestingly i and rajan have met quite a few unicorn uh, startup founders because we try to network a lot so uh, we met prashant pitti who's one of the co-founders at is my trip and prashant was personally telling us about his journey of eventually building a unicorn startup right so for 7 years prashant startup was growing at just a negligible rate in his own words right it was not growing it was stuck it had plateaued for 7 years yet he persisted and now it's valued at just about 12000 crores that's it not not a lot of money yeah so the point is that you need the right set of people to be persistent enough to build with you now very important question that a steel grower asked in john shark tank and i'm pretty sure a lot of you must have thought about this at some point even if you're not particularly interested in startups which is what equity to give to your co-founder and how should you get to that number right uh there are multiple ways to go about doing this but i have built a very simple weighted average table which works brilliantly for most of the people right it's very simple to understand very easy to calculate and will give you an exact number so if ashish grower asks you bhai aisa kyu bol raha hai then you'll have an answer to it that hey it's 47.5% for me and 52.5 for my co-founder and here is the breakup of why we have these numbers it's simple first you list down the important factors for your startup basically factors that are going to contribute towards the success of your business now certain things are common capital chahiye hota hai at least for most of the business right you need some capital correct next time are you investing a certain amount of time to this venture sometimes you are working with somebody where your co-founder is just investing capital they are not investing time right next networks who do you know at the end of the day startup ecosystem is run by networks tech skills non tech skills sector expertise very self understandable now what i'm going to do is i'm going to give a weight out of 5 to all of these factors whenever you are making this sheet for yourself you can add as many factors as you want as long as both you and your co-founder are on the same page so I give them a number five on five for capital, three on five on time. These are all random numbers that I've given, right? Your numbers should not be random. Your numbers should be well thought through, right? So you need to think that okay, my co-founder is giving more time than I am, but having said that, time is not as important as capital for this particular business. Capital is more important. This is true for manufacturing heavy industries, where the capital requirement is huge. right networks are very important tech skills are not important for this particular venture right it could be a very very important thing for your own venture so what i do is i give all of them weights according to their importance out of 5 and the next thing that i do is that i list down the contribution from the first founder out of 100% right so 0.5 is 50% 0.3 is 30% 0.7 is 70%. So out of the total capital, what am I ca- contributing over here? 50%. What is the contribution from my end when it comes to networks? 70%. Maybe I am better networked than my co-founders, right? What is my contribution in tech skills? Zero. I, I don't know how to do tech, right? So we list down the contribution of the first founder. and accordingly calculate the contribution for the second founder for the ease of calculation in this table we are only using we are assuming that there are only two co-founders but this table could be made for infinite number of co-founders right an interesting fact is that alibaba had 17 co-founders eventually jack ma bought most most of them out right so you can add 17 co-founders to this table if you want but Once I've done this, all that I have to do is calculate the numbers. So five into zero point five is 
2.5. Basic math, right? I simply multiply the number to get the multiple for the first founder. I do the same for the second founder. So if someone has doubt about how we are getting the number for the second founder, we are automatically assuming that if the first founder has 0.3, the second founder will have 0.7. Right? The difference. I am able to get all of these numbers. I add them. I divide, it, divide the total number by the total number of weights. Basic weighted average. And I multiply the final number by 100. So 9.5 by 20 into 100 is 47.5%. This number could have very well been a 90-10. And if my investors would have asked me, Shara, why do you have 90% stake and why does your co-founder have a 10% stake? I can show this, co this table with confidence and give them an exact understanding of why my co-founder has significantly lesser equity than I do. Right? So now you know how to get an exact number, which is very important. Next, product. So, uh, I'm assuming that uh, you guys have heard about minimum viable product somewhere, right? Uh, minimum viable product came from a very popular ideology uh, suggested by Eric Riles, which was on the lean startup method. The lean startup method basically talked about how you can build a venture at least amount of cost, with least amount of efforts, right? While ensuring that you're able to move fast. However, that ideology has now grown old. The problem is that if you today ship a shitty product, people would not give it a second thought before deleting it or not using it or disposing it off and simply dropping a bad review. In 2013, you could have built an app, launched it, even if it would have had bugs, people would have persisted with it because they were used to buggy life. Right? Or their entire phone used to start hanging at certain points of time, right? Some of the apps used to get stuck, even the most, most popular ones. I still remember using Facebook in 2013 and I remember that my app used to hang at that time. Right? So, we were accustomed to it. Unfortunately, or fortunately for us, we are not anymore. We have very less attention span. We want a great product right now. So, we got to change this ideology. We can't go for a minimum viable product. So let me try and take a very simple example to help you understand how this works. So when there are a lot of guests visiting your place, and let's assume you're cooking dal, right? So when you make dal, you have your first draft ready, which is boiled pulses. You've probably added a couple of things to it. And now you're going to taste it yourself. You're not going to straight away, you know, serve that to your guests, right? So you're going to taste it yourself. You're going to see how it tastes. On the basis of the flavors, you're going to add spices, you're going to add ghee, you're going to add tadka, whatever you want to. And then you're going to try and uh, try it again. Okay, how is it tasting now? Is it better? Is it worse? Did I end up adding too much salt to it? Maybe I did. So how do I neutralize it now? <laughs> right? And then I'll again probably do something around it. I'll taste it again and now I'll be like, okay, now it's good. Now I can probably serve it to other people as well. So there's a process, right? The same way you need to figure out how do you build that dal without exposing a lot of customers and ensuring that the first customer who actually tastes your products loves it. And that is what a minimum lovable product is. That you make sure that you are putting in least amount of efforts, least amount of capital, least amount of resources, but you are able to make a first draft that people actually love. Right? So that the first 100 people who end up tasting your product, they're like, wow, this is, this is amazing. I would want more people to try this. Right? The marshmallow test is a very, very interesting experiment. And it's more of a philosophical experiment than just an experiment that is relevant for product. So there were two batches of kids. Basically, they, 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 uh, an, a psychologist got mad and he decided to get a lot of kids, you know. And all of these kids were exposed to marshmallows. They were given one rule, which is that if you don't consume this marshmallow in the next one hour, you'll get another one. If you decide to consume it, this will be the last marshmallow that you'll get. Very simple experiment, okay? A few of the kids ended up eating marshmallow, a few of them did not. Over a period of time, their life tra trajectory was measured. 
people who resisted eating that marshmallow in the first hour ended up being significantly more successful than those who decided to consume it straight away right so what are they really doing they are willing to let go of their current present or their present luxuries for long lasting success in the future right you need to apply this principle when it comes to product as well when we are tasting that dal we like it we like okay this is decent good enough to be served to my parents not good enough to be served to guests right that mentality goes a long way when it comes to the product so we are not living in a world where as soon as you build a product you start marketing it everywhere it's better to only show it or showcase it to a few people who would actually be interested in this particular product and are likely to love it and very very important part is active experimentation so basically building a startup is very very chaotic you would not have answers to a lot of questions the only way that you can find answers is through active experimentation what i mean by exp active experimentation is that in sciences what do you do when you are actually trying to experiment with something you drop something to a beaker you you put a litmus paper inside you you test whether it's acidic or it's basic right in a very simple similar way you need to test out multiple alternative decisions in startups right for example i believe that the best way to sell my product is by going to door to door i want to go door to door in every uh, you know person in the colony and see if i am able to sell the product now instead of only trying that what if i only test this out in 10 households and i spend the rest of the money on digital marketing or in print media and then after spending the equal amount of money in all of these three mediums i see which one of them is giving me the best return on investment that helps me figure out the best alternative straight away it's not as easy as it sounds when you're trying to test out multiple alternatives and decisions it becomes more and more complex but active experimentation is like chat gpt for your startups it will help you get answers to anything and everything that you want if it's done the right way so i'm going to be quick with this slide because i would want rajan to also come in uh, so quickly i'm going to cover sales so to help you guys understand sales i'm going to take one case study a very popular case study of a company called pfizer right so pfizer in 1980s developed a drug called viagra right and when they made viagra they started reaching out to american newspapers right and they were like we want we want to sell this dark drug it's revolutionary there is no competitive product out there and 10% of all men in america face erectile dysfunction so it's a great product it can actually change the sex life of so many people but all of these newspapers were like we are not going to do this this is just doesn't align with the vision of conservatism that we have right so viagra basically did held a press conference okay the presenter of this press conference stripped down naked consumed the viagra and showed it impact its impact to all the people who were there in the press conference now you could have imagined what would have happened next right all the newspapers all the portals were literally talking about what happened here this is not acceptable right viagra phase and pfizer phase a lot of criticism but what that actually did was help them get publicity men who were actually going through the problem rejoiced with joy because they finally had an answer they started flocking to chemists and within 7 years pfizer became a unicorn so when it comes to sales what you need to understand is that there is something that we call the sales funnel sales 101 it has four elements to it awareness interest desire action awareness is about ensuring that more and more people are aware about the product that you are building interest is about ensuring that you are either solving the want of the person or the need or maybe even both right desire actually convincing the people that they should buy your product and not the other alternatives because not about its features but because it's being sold by you the entrepreneur or the brand at the end of the day is the real value proposition between two products 
even if one company has a huge lead in terms of innovation in a particular product, eventually the competitors will catch up. We saw that with Apple also. But Apple's sales did not de decline because of that. Because by then, Apple had built a relationship with its customers. Make sense? And finally, action. Ensure that people are actually going to the stores and buying your product. So I think on that note, I would want Rajan to take over and talk about some of the things like fundraising and market research. Thank you so much. So yeah, I'm, uh, I would be talking about fundraising. I mean, for every business, it's very important to raise funds. But I think first question you need to ask yourself whether you actually need, need funds or not. Because there has been a there has been a thing that you know fundraising becomes suddenly gambler, uh, glamorous, right? That okay, my startup has raised five million dollars. People bragging about the fundraising metrics, but more or less, I think they should think that what kind of a sales they are trying to do. And you will see a lot of startups have raised a lot of funds, but they are not able to do a lot of sales, and because of which the valuations are going down, and people are saying the bubble is going to burst. This and that. This is all is being happening. So um, yesterday I attended a conference where they were talking about three phases of startups. So uh, the, the speaker was uh, uh, Rohit Bansal who is a co-founder of Snapdeal. So I luckily got a chance to attend that conference and they talked about three things. Earlier in 2012 or 2013 what used to happen that founders used to show their profile that here we are from IIT Delhi, we are from IIM Ahmedabad, we are from INSEAD and on the basis of the profile they used to raise funds. right? What happened during 2016 and 2017? If anyone is doing something different, investors are willing to invest. Okay, if he is doing, doing something different, okay, this particular VC has invested, we should not miss the train. So earlier, founders were trying to sell the, like raise funds through their profile. Later on, they were trying to raise funds through doing something different. But now if you see very carefully that due diligence is happening and if you have great numbers, then only investors are putting money in your company. So it means now no one will see that how great profile you have, no one will see how innovative product you have. See the pushing a key revenue kitna kar rahe And I think this has a so this has been changed till 2012 to 2020 see that now in India also people are more focusing on revenue and if you want to raise funds you have to keep your metrics very strong. This is a curve that has been uh, there. Uh, this is a curve that is there, right? When it comes to startup phase, startup phase means when you are at a zero time. So x axis is time and y axis is revenue. No, no am I five minutes? I think. Oh, he's trying to find yeah, sure, sure. Hi. So when you are at a startup stage, probably with zero revenue and zero time, you would be raising from FFF, which is founders, friends, and family. So for example, if is kisi ke mind mein koi idea aata hai, they go to their parents and parents say, okay, that uncle is very rich or that aunt is very rich, go call them. So this is how it used to happen at a, at a very infant stage, right? That you go to your relatives. So this is called FFF, where founders and family put money in the company. When you have a product, it means you might not have any numbers, but you have a product which you want to take it to outside and show it to people and you need money. And that we call early stage. So in early stage, individuals come and invest. So for example, if uh, let's say um, I have a lot of money and if someone, Ayush comes and asks me that, okay, Rajan, please fund my company and I'm coming as an investor. So I would call myself as an angel investor. But let's say now Ayush business has grown to some extent and he's doing a lot of sales and he says that I want to expand outside India. So maybe first I might not take him very seriously. I might say that, okay, you are joking, but in case it happens, if it really happens, so what we will do? Now, now we need more money. So I will ask in this room that how many people have actually a lot of money. And let's say if 10, 12 people, we have a lot of money. You have a lot of money, but you don't know how to scrutinize startups. And so what I will do, I say, I will come and tell you that let, let me scrutinize the startups and you all pool your money together and let's start a VC firm called Metri Capital. So now if you are pooling money in Metvi Capital and on your behalf I am shortlisting 10 startups, putting money in 10 startups and giving returns to you, so that will be called a venture capital. So venture capital comes at the growth stage when your ask is probably 200 CR, 300 CR, 400 CR, 1000 CR and if the ask is more than 1000 CR then it comes to private equity. It means that you are an unlisted company but you are a matured business and you need a big player to drive your growth. So this is how it curves looks like that 
from angel investor to venture capital but it doesn't mean that you can't raise from a vc at the idc stage uh, it's uh, we at met we have raised uh, almost three rounds of funding now uh, our first round happened when probably we were in college uh, i was in my second year uh, i was in my third year and shore is one is in second year and we raised it from this uh, andc instat foundation so they actually came as a incubator so incubator is not mentioned but incubator can also be a stage of funding because they also uh, give mentorship and funds to startups generally it's, it's angel investor venture capital but incubator can also be there so this is how it happened uh, just give me a second next I th so i think now we would be wrapping up the the uh, session because we we had very less time so talking just about metri that what we do right now uh, just a small uh, brief of what we are trying to do we are trying to um, create cohort based learning experiences for students for example in one hour like we made you teach entrepreneurship so we have a complete program on entrepreneurship that we teach to multiple students right so far we have taught 15000 students and it's not just entrepreneurship data analytics how to get into consultancy firms a lot of skill sets are there where you know sometimes i think college education needs to be supplemented with some other practical aspect so for example in our cohort entrepreneurship we will ask you to work on a venture we will ask you to make cost sheet we will ask you to make a pitch deck in in a month of in one month spam so this is how we have collaborated with srcc in the past iit delhi ashoka iim indore uh, 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 more than 50 colleges now and right now we are also helping colleges to understand you know because the new education policy also uh, you know want colleges to put entrepreneurship as a very active part of the curriculum when it comes to having industrial sessions when it comes to internships so we are also trying to uh, involve in that and helping colleges in creating a curriculum that is more nep compliant and uh, yeah yeah i mean happy to take any questions so with this we would be concluding the session as a result yes yeah uh, so this curriculum that you are talking about is it uh, specific for the subject that a student has to come from or is it like a for every example of commerce to be theory anyone can do it that is a beauty because we have tried to make it in a way even if you are from even if you have just 12th pass or 10th pass then also we would be able to make you understand what is entrepreneurship how did you guys come up with this idea so basically initially we started with a hyper local networking app it was sort of a hyper local linkedin then let's say if i am looking for a lawyer in this room there is a corporate lawyer so we get a notification and that is how we i think we pitched this idea to andc